Um, yeah, so I have the honor of presenting, uh, well, not presenting all of the modules, but giving you an impression of um, the local modules that we have developed in the last, not decades, but three years. Um, mostly online due to you know what and who, right? Uh, but anyway, it has been really inspiring to work in five different settings and develop the local modules. So today we would like to present the modules um, uh, and also to see three examples of the activities that we have developed that, that are available on the site. And of course, also have a broader discussion on how bridging the indoor and outdoor school activities by using linguistic landscapes can contribute to promoting critical language awareness, thus maybe also making a contribution to reducing language inequity in education. Uh, we start by reflecting a little bit from research on one, what one can learn uh, through and with linguistic landscapes. So on the one hand, one can take the language classroom to outside spaces, to the street, uh, and take on an ethnographic focus by observing, documenting, and analyzing the so-called secret life of languages around us. This can lead to either incidental learning or really uh, raising awareness and, and noticing uh, and observing uh, linguistic landscapes in the wild. And of course, uh, by extension, it can also lead to several intercultural encounters while students and pupils are interacting with people while conducting the linguistic landscape outside. For example, with shop owners or um, passers-by in the street. But one can also bring the outside space or street to the classroom through multimodal transposition. With our local modules, we wanted to see how creating pedagogical resources based on the exploration of linguistic landscapes can help us bridge the in and outdoor spaces and promote language and content education. We have at the moment uh, 30 modules in more or less seven languages. I think we might do a couple of translations more, but not many more. And they have been divided by our team in seven different categories. Uh, some of the modules are more based on linguistic biographies, on reflection on own language uh, abilities uh, in different formats, of course. So it's more the, uh, the dimension of the awareness then we have other modules that allow to explore, allows uh, pupils to explore different languages and also different semiotic symbols and compare them, for example, developing uh, intercomprehension skills. Then we have modules that are more uh, fostering meta knowledge about multilingualism in society, about migration, for example. And we have models um, that foster more the analytic and critical skills of, of pupils which involves collecting and analyzing and reflecting on languages in different environments. And then we have several creative activities that are more for motivation to engage in language education through linguistic landscapes, like, for example, writing uh, poems in different languages or stories or crafts, arts and crafts, for example. And then, of course, we have modules that foster learning in other disciplines, such as geography, history, or global citizenship education. I will show three examples of three of these categories, but of course, uh, we invite you to go to the site that Lisa showed this morning. Um, maybe we can share the link once again uh, and explore all the other examples. So in terms of the linguistic biographies, the uh, team in Strasbourg and specifically the teachers, the history and geography teachers that were working with them suggested that the students in, in a highly multilingual setting could inquire whether their families had a history of migration and what history of migration it was. And afterwards, the students presented their results um, in a kind of a collage with both text and images. And this activity actively linked the home and family la uh, language, linguistic landscapes or the homescape uh, through these family stories that provide a, a relevant context of the, the specific homescapes. You can see here some of the examples. So you can see it um, written in French, but you can see on the right-hand side, oh, 
also several uh, Turkish words that the student has uh, uh, specifically translated. And you can see it's all about the history of grandparents or parents coming from Italy, from uh, Morocco, from Turkey, and moving in this case to France. And you can see how they wrote it themselves in different colors, there are maps, there are several pictures of the family history. Uh, there are also several uh, recipes uh, that the grandparents used to cook and the whole uh, history of the migration of these families. So this is one example on the language biography that involves writing and of course also presenting skills of the pupils. Then we have on the, on the meta level, so the wider knowledge on multilingualism in society. The uh, Hamburg team developed uh, activities so that students can explore the visibility of languages and also reflect about the semiotic representation of different groups of society. And of course, the aim is for them to develop a critical attitude towards the visibility or invisibility of languages in the linguistic landscape that they see every day. And you can see here the poster um, that they used, and it's about, you know, being needing a place to sleep uh, in cold nights. I think that everyone in this uh, Zoom meeting can read that. And then uh, in smaller letters, there are other languages, like starting with English, for example, and Russian, etc. And on the right hand side, you can see the residence by citizenship of the city of Hamburg, where the poster was hanging. So the, the students had this, um, uh, this task to complete, compare the languages represented on this poster and also the, the order of the languages, of course, um, to the presence of migrant populations in Hamburg, which discrepancies can you pinpoint? So they had to see who is not represented, who is less represented, who would not be able to read it, et cetera. So the idea, of course, was to stimulate a reflection on immigrant languages and social inequality has reproduced through linguistic inequality in this poster. And of course, this can be you know, used in different settings and examples from different settings can be used to foster this kind of um, discussions about uh, linguistic inequality in the linguistic landscapes around us. Then we come to the third example, collecting, analyzing, and reflecting on languages in different environments, involving also analytic and critical skills. And this activity we developed in the, uh, in the setting here in Friesland, in the north of the Netherlands, a bilingual uh, province with uh, several teachers. And we wanted uh, uh, the teachers to really, to students to really go outside of the classroom and take photos of specific linguistic landscapes uh, in which, uh, by, by doing which the students would become language detectives in a specific context. And then uh, we help them to create a, um, a framework to analyze the languages in their, uh, in their linguistic environment. And also the last step was to create a, an opinion, to elaborate a critical opinion. Uh, on the presence of the different languages that they had analyzed. So we developed with the teachers a whole set. So we were uh, about two weeks uh, in each of the two schools that we work with. So we developed a, a film with many linguistic landscapes in many different languages. And we had a discussion with the students about the meaning, about um, their own experience with the linguistic landscapes, about the differences between the different landscapes that we saw in the film and in the examples that we showed. Then uh, we created groups and they collected the linguistic landscapes in each of the groups. And each of the groups was expert for a specific uh, region in the city like a commercial street, the museum, the market, the railway station. We made a quantitative and a qualitative analysis of all the linguistic landscapes of all the groups. So really counting the languages, the order of the languages, um, also the size of the letter. So we had a, a whole framework that we developed before. And then we compared between the groups, the differences. And then they uh, formulated a recommendation towards urban planning that they did present to the regional government um, that is in charge of, uh, well, reshaping the linguistic landscape of uh, the region at the moment. 
And you can see here examples on the right hand side of the photos that they took. You can also see that it was really in the COVID uh, time. You can see on the right hand side uh, below it, it's uh, Frisian. And you can see on the left hand side, on the upper, upper left hand side, the museum, the Frisian Museum with Dutch Outgang and then English exit only, no Frisian. Etc. And you can see here on the left hand side, uh, one of the final recommendations of one of the groups saying um, in their final report that they were disappointed that only so few signs were in Frisian. So only 4% of the sign contained the Frisian language. And they say, well, we are in Friesland and there 60% of the people speak Frisian. So they were themselves aware of the discrepancies between the speakers and the, the local population and the representation of their local language in the linguistic landscape. And they, they say, why not, for example, in the signs announcing Leeuwarden, the capital of Friesland, why not put Leeuwarden, which is the Frisian word for the city? And then they conclude by saying, we want more Frisian in the linguistic landscape of our city. And these were uh, non-Frisian speakers that had rather negative attitudes towards learning the language before engaging with the linguistic landscapes. So with this uh, language detective activity, we wanted to stimulate a reflection on linguistic hierarchies in a typically bilingual region uh, and on linguistic landscapes has a marker of linguistic power relations. And we also wanted to stimulate their activist um, attitudes of, of really feeling we have the power to change this. We can recommend something different and we want our linguistic landscape to be different. And uh, after this, we conducted this, they went with post-its and tried to change the linguistic landscape of the school, after which we got some complaints uh, uh, by the teachers, by the way. But we kind of like their uh, activistic attitude at the end of, uh, of this, this project. So what did we learn when exploring linguistic landscapes with our pupils in the language classroom? Well, of course, there was a, a reflection or, well, a gain in language awareness uh, and also in critical thinking skills. And the, the students developed many analytic skills that they were not aware that they had before engaging uh, in our research. And of course, many other skills, pragmatic competence, multimodal literacy skills. We also saw language learning, like pupils comparing languages and non-Frisian pupils in our case learned a lot of Frisian through engaging with the linguistic landscape that they saw. And of course, uh, in general, multi-competence or plurilingual competence was developed. Then of course, they had many multimodal learning experiences. Uh, and of course, they gained participatory skills, making, collecting data, analyzing the data, form, formulating recommendations on the, base, on the basis of their data, interviewing uh, their grandparents, writing things down, presenting, etc. And of course, also in terms of the commitment towards and engagement in building more sustainable urban communities and more linguistically equal education environments. So at the end, we feel that the local modules that we have now on the site uh, uh, represent linguistic landscapes as a socially engaged pedagogical approach and field of research grounded in ideas of social justice to promote linguistic equity. Um, to sum up, uh, what uh, all the modules are based on a kind of uh, um, three principles. The principles <clears throat> include uh, observation, but a close observation. So what do I really see? What do I exactly see? So training students to observe the linguistic landscapes in a different way. And then of course, reflection. Why is what I see in this way? Why uh, are there different power relations? Why are there li linguistic hierarchies? Why is the order of certain languages uh, in this way? And who decides this? And then, of course, uh, the third idea is that uh, observation and reflection will lead to linguistic activism on behalf of these young learners. So what can I do to change the situation? What actions can I take? So to sum up, linguistic landscapes in education do have the potential to transform individual subjectivities and pedagogical practices in relation to, in this case, linguistic diversity and migration. 
And we also saw uh, while conducting the research that when provided with appropriate opportunities for observation and reflection, these linguistic landscapes can be a useful tool to promote linguistic activism, maybe not in all age groups and not with all activities, of course. But linguistic landscapes do allow teachers and students to rethink multilingualism as a more inclusive concept and to think of languages as attached to issues of power, equity and sustainable human development. And of course, they help students and teachers reconsider their own role in a globalized and multilingual world and to engage uh, more actively in the transformation of their own communities. So we agree with Ingrid Piller when she says that through linguistic landscapes, teachers and students understand that some languages are more equal than others and that linguistic difference is rarely neutral, but more often hierarchically structured. And that of course they have a role to, pay, to play in how these hierarchies are structured now and in the future. Uh, I hope that you are now very curious to go to the site and explore the rest of the modules and I'm looking forward, or I think we also, Sylvia and Lisa, are looking forward for all the questions. But now I have to look for you again because, ah, there you are. I will stop sharing, otherwise I don't see you. Yeah.